Father, we settle our hearts before you. We thank you for your word. We ask that you would open our hearts to your word and please open your word to our hearts that we might understand what you're saying to us clearly and then look at the world around us to see what we find. Lord, may this time be blessed, may it be helpful. Lord, some of us remember some of these transitional forms presented in school. It's nice to know the rest of the story. And so I pray, Father, these things would be clear and simple and easy to follow. And we pray you bless this time with your presence through your word and the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. You and I know it as our atmosphere. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, an herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made the two lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day, <clears throat> and God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life, nefesh, again, soul, 475 times, life, 117 times, mind, 15 times, that hath life, and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great tanin, whales as well as other sea creatures, and every living creature, again, nefesh, that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill, the word is male, fill, we'll need it again later, fill the waters and the seas and let the fowl multiply in the earth and the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And so verse 24, we continue. And God said, again, Elohim, more than two, said, masculine, personal, singular. God, he said, let the earth bring forth. Now that word is yetzah. And that is to bring forth out or to come forth out of. So out of the earth, God creating, let the earth bring forth the living. Here's again, nefesh, soul, or again, living, nefesh. Let God bring forth the living creature after his kind. There's that theme again. Cattle, the word is behima, cattle. Also translated beast 136 times, cattle 53 times, animal one time. It's, it's four-footed animals, cows, rhinos, whatever it may be, horses, behema. How many have read the book of Job? Okay, very good. How many like to be Job? Not a hand, two services in a row. In there, in chapter 40, he is challenged by God to consider the behemoth. Bahima, number 229 of Strong's Bahimoth, number 230, is derived out of that word Bahima. And Bahimoth, as we go through, you will see quite clearly is a dinosaur, but we'll get to some of that after the flood. The living creature, cattle, and creeping, verse 24, creeping thing, 
and beast of the earth, that's chaya, that's beast or animal. Again, creeping or things that moveth, so the land animals of the earth. Note this again, after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth, heard, and what do you think's next? After his kind. How many have gotten the idea? It's a theme here in creation. Things will reproduce. Dogs will give you dogs. Cats will give you cats. Cows will give you cows, etc., etc. That's what you're going to find. And we'll look at that again today. God made the beast, again, the Haya, of the earth after his kind, and the cattle, Bahima, after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth, somebody help me, after his kind, that's the tenth time we've had it. It's almost like it's important. When you go digging for evidence, you will only find things that produce after their kind. And God saw that it was good. Verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image. Okay, some real things are happening. So once again, let's go to some slides, do our best. And if they work, we'll do even better. So once again, we're looking at the six days of creation. Now we're at land animals and man. We're going to focus more on the land animals right now. But the secular theory is there was a big bang. <clears throat> Two major ideas behind it. One, all the matter in the universe condensed down to the size of a decimal point or a period on a page, spinning very hot, lots of pressure, boom, blows up into the vacuum of space, which should have, in theory, put everything in the same direction, evenly distributed, but we find galaxies are not evenly distributed. We find giant voids, and you know in our own solar system, things are rotating in opposite directions. And since we've been through that, a new article's out with a new sun going the wrong way with its planets, but we'll maybe get to that later. Then you have sun, moon, and stars, they form. Then you have the earth forming, they say, 4.6 billion years ago. But if you've been with us and seen the evidence, you know that once you get to 1.4 billion years, the moon slams into the earth. So they cannot be 4.6 billion years old just by observing how they interact. It's got to be 1.4 billion or less. But they don't tell you that. Next thing they tell us is that the earth cooled. It formed dry land and seas. It rained on the seas for millions of years. And then somehow the right chemicals got into place. And then suddenly we had this simple living cell that spontaneously generated through some sort of activity. And yet we now know that the simplest of cells need some 250 proteins in exactly the right order to function, which is statistically impossible to do through random chance. But look, give it to him anyway. So then suddenly we get simple life form. It finds a way to survive, reproduce, and then through favorable mutations, it eventually becomes invertebrates. The invertebrates through favorable mutations become vertebrates or fish. We looked last week and all we find are invertebrates and vertebrates. We don't find half of one, half of the other. And this is supposed to go then from fish to getting legs to climbing out on the air and beginning to get land animals out of that. And so with that theory of favorable mutations of one becoming another, we should find thousands, thousands of these forms trying to change or transition from one to the other. We have thus far found basically zero that have ever survived real scientific scrutiny. They should have thousands. But eventually they get out and they become land walking animals all the way up to monkeys, and then eventually you if you behave. But today we're gonna to deal with again this idea of amoeba to man. Each of these jumps from one form to another should have many failures along the road that would show us how they transitioned and we don't have any. We just have a lot of artist drawings and textbooks but no real evidence to prove it. Fine. A reminder, we've been going through these different periods. Last time we looked at the Cambrian and Precambrian. We have these organisms that show up in Precambrian. Suddenly we got a whole bunch of new stuff in Cambrian and we have no way to get from one to the other. Nothing in the middle, they just show up. We quoted several people, David Berlinski from his book, A Tour of the Calculus, he's an evolutionist. He said, quote, there is no question that such gaps exist. A big gap, big gap appears at the beginning of the Cambrian explosion over 500 million, million years ago when great numbers of new species suddenly appeared. Dun, dun, dun in the fossil record. That's what this says should happen. New stuff suddenly appears. Evolution says we have to have a path to get there, but we can't find the path. Cambrian explosion again, Ariel Roth from his book Origins said the Cambrian explosion is not just a case of all the major animal phyla appearing at about the same place in the geologic column. It also is a situation of no ancestors. Let me repeat that, no ancestors, intermediate form to suggest how they might have evolved. We don't have them, but we have a theory. 
And that theory was this. There's a simple cell, which we talked about. There is no such thing as a simple cell, but Darwin couldn't know that back then, but we do. And that simple cell through favorable mutations would eventually mutate into these different lines of animals and other things that would essentially evolve into what are our modern day representation of animals around the earth. So that was the theory. It's all supposed to branch together. Now this is what they actually find. They just find them after their kind in the fossils and living, which supports Genesis. So we talked about last time Archaeopteryx and whales. We went through that, showed the changes that have to happen. I promised on day six we'd do the horse, so boom, here we go. This is the horse coming from an evolutionary history of the modern horse from Microsoft and Carta Encyclopedia. First service, we're older, no offense, right? Third service, you guys Google everything. Second service, you're in the middle. How many of you remember being in school and all having to use the same encyclopedias? Collinger, Encyclopedia Britannica, and the other ones, right? You know, and, and, the, and you're all plagiarizing. I mean, the teacher all knows you're all using the same thing. You're all trying to rewrite. The, it's like the modern Bible translations. You're all trying to do just enough word change to get a copyright on it, right? I mean, and, I mean that, it must have been so boring as a teacher. Like, here's a, that's page five. Or there's a, you know. If you don't know those days, you have no idea how, how fortunate you are to be able to, to Google and bring things up. Because we had 12, 24 volumes, and they were from like 1960. <laughs> Seriously. That was called learning. From this Microsoft and Carta 2000, it says, the horse is a well-documented case study in evolution. Well, fantastic. The fossil record shows clear steps in the progression from a four-toed small browsing animal to one of a line that gave rise to tapirs, tapirs sorry, rhinoceroses, and other mammals in addition to horses to the modern horse. Great. Note they have the four-toed going to the one-toed there in the picture. <coughs> Well, that's wonderful. Now, let's find out what's actually out there. Jonathan Safadi, Jonathan Safadi, has some really good books. One is Refuting Evolution, really good, really good. Second one, Refuting Evolution Two, really good. Uh, he's got great stuff out there, but he notes this. As the biologist Hubert Nielsen said, the family tree of the horse is beautiful and continuous only in the textbooks. And the famous paleontologist Niles Eldridge called the textbook picture lamentable and a classical case of paleontologic museology. In other words, nice to have but doesn't exist. Why would they say this? Well, first thing they don't tell you is scientists find the fossil horses mixed throughout all the different layers. So you got a one horse below a four, a one toe below a four toe, a three toe above a two toe, a two toe, they're all jumbled, which would mean they all lived at the same time. The first animal in the series, Eohippus, is so different from the modern horse and so different from the next one in the series, there's a big question concerning whether or not it belongs in the series. Hmm. So this is what they show you, right? The idea is uh, that they have this wonderful picture, this gradual slow change of one you know, horse type evolving to another horse type eventually. And so the problem is they don't tell you that the rib count, the vertebra count, the tooth count, the size of the animal varies widely and does not show any direct line of progression. So these little blue nice horsies, I'm using the plural, these little blue horsies they suppose are there don't actually exist in the fossil record. What they find are these different types of what are horse, and some argue this may not be even qualified for that. They just keep showing up after their, their, their horse, but they're variations. They just show up after their kind. And so what they say is, well, since we don't have gradualism, then we'll just call it punctuated equilibria, which is essentially a Hail Mary pass to the end zone, hoping that you will find that somehow we went from this to this with no way to get between the two. In other words, this is what we find, this is what we think happened, but it's awfully hard to prove what happened when this is all you find. One-toed, three-toed, two-toed, four-toed, and they're all jumbled. Notice the drawings. The idea is just variation within a kind. They also don't tell you this. Uh, first of all, there are many different varieties of horses that exist today, and here in Chester County, I don't even have to explain that, right? Because this is horse country. It's the feeding ground for the Devon Horse Show. The extinct Eohippus was almost identical in body design, feet, toes, and size to the modern living Hyrex. So we still have something around there that looks like the earliest so-called in the line. The only difference is the skull and the tail have some variability, but it still would be in that family. It's still round. They also don't tell you this. In North America, they generally find three-toed going to one-toed as they dig, which is great until you go to South America where they find one-toed going to three-toed, so the toes are going the wrong way. 
depending on where you are in the world. If this truly evolved, it should be the same all around. It's not, because they're jumbled, because they all were alive at the same time. These are variations. Today, they're also big and little horses still exist. It's just variety within the kind. One is, of course, less expensive to feed. <laughs> so here you go. The fact is what we find both outside and in the oceans, as well as here with whales and horses, we find them after their own kind. There's variation within the kind, but they always reproduce after their kind. Again, a Chihuahua and a Great Dane are both dogs with a big variation, but they're still dogs. So watch out for this, because they've been telling us how things supposedly evolved from one to the other, but what's lacking is the way it happened. Mike Riddle, Institute for Creation Research, did some really great work on the fossil record. I'm going to be borrowing from him, so just a shout out. If you like his stuff, I encourage you to go get his lecture on the fossil record. It's on DVD. Uh, you can go catch it, but Mike Riddle, good stuff, and we're going to use some of it today. So just giving credit where credit is due. How many remember this picture from school? Okay, a few hands. Let's start with Piltdown Man. The New York Times ran an article, Darwin Theory Proved True, dun, dun, dun. featured in textbooks and encyclopedias. 1953, scientists studied the bones, and the truth, they were about 600 years old. What do you mean? Well, here, if you notice Charles Dawson, this is uh, a reprint from Reader's Digest. Some of you may not know what that is, but Reader's Digest, a reprint, 1956, here's Charles Dawson. He's the one who supposedly discovered the jawbone of Piltdown Man. And it says here for more than 40 years. Some argue one is almost as long as 50 years. One account I read said there were 500 dissertations written about Piltdown Man, and then it was discovered to be false. Oops. This is what was found. A jawbone, a tooth, and part of a skull. The white is what they added. <laughs> no, this is important. You're going to see this a lot today. So just what's dark is what was found. So this coming from uh, National Geographic Piltdown Man. In 1912, scientists thought they discovered the elusive missing link between human and ape found in a gravel pit in Piltdown, England. Hence the name. Piltdown. Nice. Good to see you all up to speed. A set of intriguing skull and jaw fragments were later reconstructed by the British Museum into a human-like head with an ape-like jaw. In 1953, it turned out that the find wasn't proof of anything other than the skill of the still anonymous forger. Clearly, they don't get Reader's Digest. <laughs> the skull was a medieval human's, 600 years. The jaw was of an orangutan's, and the teeth were of a chimp. Now, that's a hybrid. It was false. Then came Nebraska Man in 1922. Fossil evidence was discovered. It was used to support the bringing of evolution into the schools in the 1925 Scopes Monkey Trial. The claim, it was one million years old. It was the intermediate link. What did they have? A tooth. From that, here, Illustrated London, 1922. These guys are good. Not only could they draw Nebraska Man, but they got his wife down, too. <laughs> now, that's art. And then they figured out what kind of tooth it was. It was an extinct pig. Yet this would get people to think somehow God didn't create them. Then we have Ramapithecus, 1930s. This is what they found. What they drew was this, something on its way up to walking upright. Time Magazine, November 7th, 1977, note the date, 77, said this. Ramapithecus is ideally structured to be an ancestor of hominids, if he isn't, we don't have anything else that is. <laughs> they claimed he was 14 million year old, intermediate between ape-like creatures and humans. The truth, uh, 1970, 77, 70, a baboon li living in Ethiopia was discovered with these same dental structures, same morphological features found on Ramapithecus, and suddenly Ramapithecus dropped from the human line because he was in fact a baboon. So here are some of the first ones. Nebraska man, Piltdown, Rampithecus, all found to be not what they were supposedly. Two were hoaxes. One was a pig, one was an ape, and, and the dates were all wrong. So two case studies, one Neanderthals, and there's an article this week talking about how they think the magnetic field flip reversal killed the Neanderthals. When I'm done, I'll probably spare you the article. But here was the original drawing of Neanderthal. This guy looks like he's serious. He's looking for you. Found first near Dusseldorf, Germany in 1856. Constructed to look ape-like. Brain capacity was about 200 cc's larger than ours. 
Initial construction, though, discovered to be wrong. Why? Because as they kept digging and researching, they found that Neanderthals used jewelry, used musical instruments, did cave paintings, were capable of speech, and buried their dead. What does that mean? Well, Martin Lubnow said recovery of mitochondrial DNA of Neanderthals in evaluation. He said this. Most anthropologists, thank you, recognize burial as a very human and very religious act. But the strongest evidence that Neanderthals were fully human and of our species is that at four sites, Neanderthals and modern humans were buried together. That would make them family. Well, that's basically how they do it. Here's a drawing coming from the book Buried Alive, which is quite good, by Jack Cuso, Dr. Jack Cuso. Here's a drawing of the Neanderthal fossil purchased at a souvenir counter in Berlin, and it gave an ape-like appearance. Why? Because the drawing moved the jaw forward, 30 millimeters. This is actually what it looks like. But they wanted to give it a different appearance. So they have a thick brow, which happens not only with it's a function of aging, but also a lot of muscle use in the face can also cause the bones to build up. Uh, they have short, stocky bodies with short extremities, and my answer is so. <laughs> and three, I think I wrestled a few of these guys in high school. So. 1965, Neanderthals were a subspecies of humans. 1997, Neanderthals were a separate species based on mitochondrial DNA findings. We'll get to that in a minute. The results of mitochondrial DNA show clearly that the Neanderthal was not our direct ancestor, unlike earlier hypotheses made by some paleoanthropologists. You're thinking, what's mitochondrial DNA? Glad you asked. Outside of the nucleus of your cells, the mitochondria, in there is your mitochondrial DNA, which you inherit from your mother, which means she's always with you. <laughs> That's gonna be very helpful when they leave the ark and they condense down to eight people genetically and then explode again from there and migrate all over the earth. This actually helps us to follow human migration. You have your nucleus of your cell, which has your nuclear DNA, which is the DNA you think of the double helix more often being shown to you in school and everything else. But from the mitochondrial DNA, you can learn a whole lot. And from this, they made some comparisons. They compared one Neanderthal to 1,669 modern humans. What they found was, when compared to modern humans, there were 22 mitochondrial DNA substitution differences. <gasps> dun, dun, dun. Hold on. Between modern humans, the range is between 1 to 24. Yes, he was more within the range than modern humans, of humans. You're thinking, well, what does that mean? Well, what it means is there are a few modern humans who differ by two substitutions more than that individual Neanderthal did to the 1,669 humans. So, therefore, using the evolutionist logic, these people are a separate species and not human which means out of all three services, roughly 8% of you are not human. <laughs> Be nice, I have premarital class after this. No jokes. So they have a protruding brow ridge, they have a stocky build, short extremities. That's just simply, again, an isolated gene pool can do that very easily as well. Isolated population of people. They live in a cold, harsh climate. They're 100% human. Yet you're still seeing articles that are going like, mm, maybe, even this week. So here's the other case study, Lucy. <clears throat> Lucy found in 1974 by David Johansson. Claimed to be a great missing link. 40% of the fossil was found. Claimed to be 3.5 million years old. Claimed to be bipedal, which means walking upright to you and me. And this is what they found in the bones, and this is what they made. Anybody see hands? A few bones, but hands. Anybody see feet? Okay. Anybody see full cranial structure? So what was found? Did she walk upright? Johansson put out a book, Lucy, The Beginning of Humankind. I think he has an opinion. They say she's our ancestor. The artists gave some drawings. Here's one they made of it. The idea of the contemplative gaze, the use of tools. The, one of the artists involved, John Gersh, said this. I wanted to get a human soul into this ape-like face to indicate something about where he was headed. Well, thanks. So here's what we need to do to determine if Lucy walked upright. We've got three areas we have to look at. Rib cage, pelvis, leg, and foot bones. Fine. Rib cage. Ape ribs are conical. Human ribs are barrel-like. Human are on the left, barrel, conical on the right, ape. There's a difference. 
It's Peter Schmid, he's a paleontologist, a paleontologist, sorry, at the Anthropological Institute in Zurich, quoted in uh, Origins Reconsidered in Search of What Makes Us Human by Richard Leakey and Robert Lewin. He said, quote, I noticed that the ribs were more round in cross-section, more like what you see in apes. This is Lucy. Ribs are flatter, human ribs are flatter in cross-section. But the shape of the rib cage itself was the biggest surprise of all. The human rib cage is barrel shaped and I just couldn't get Lucy's ribs to fit this kind of shape, which would mean she's not human, she's an ape. Brad Harub, uh, PhD in anatomy and neurobiology and Brett Thompson, uh, PhD microbiology, truth about human origins, page 247, they said in Lucy's case, her ribs are conical like those found in apes. Stern and Sussman, American Journal of Physical Anthropology said, Quote, the fact that the anterior portion of the iliac blade face, faces laterally in humans, but not in chimpanzees is obvious, talking about the pelvis. The marked resemblance of Lucy to the chimpanzee is equally obvious. It suggests to us that the mechanism of lateral pelvic balance during bipedalism was closer to that in apes than in humans. Again, her pelvis looks like an ape, and they're quite different. Now, I'm going to show you something from PBS, and it's not a joke. Here we go. This is regarding Lucy. The ape that stood up, it was a revolutionary idea. We needed Owen Lovejoy's expertise again, because the evidence wasn't quite adding up. The knee looked human, but the shape of her hip didn't. Superficially, her hip resembled a chimpanzee's which meant that Lucy couldn't possibly have walked like a modern human. But Lovejoy noticed something odd about the way the bones had been fossilized. When I put the two parts of the pelvis together that we had, this part of the pelvis has pressed so hard and so completely into this one that it caused it to be broken into a series of individual pieces which were then fused together in later fossilized. Uh, by the way, 1994 VHS, here's the second part. Uh, this has caused the two bones, in fact, to fit together so well that they're in an anatomically impossible position. The perfect fit was an illusion that made Lucy's hip bone seem to flare out like a chimp's. But all was not lost. Lovejoy decided he could restore the pelvis to its natural shape. He didn't want to tamper with the original, so he made a copy in plaster. He cut the damaged pieces out and put them back together the way they were before Lucy died. It was a tricky job, but after taking the kink out of the pelvis, it all fit together perfectly like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. As a result, the angle of the hip looks nothing like a chimp's, but a lot like ours. <laughs> the knee joint, uh, if you remember, was not complete. You had one leg, left leg and then right leg, and it is argued that it was found some distance away. But what they do have, the angle is incorrect. Humans are nine degrees, it's 15. Wrong knee joint. Nine degrees for orangutans as well. Charles Oxnard, he's an evolutionary anatomist, uh, quite, quite renowned in his field. Looking at this on these fossils, he said, the, you can read it, known over the last several decades are now irrevocably removed from a place in the evolution of human bipedalism. And Oxnard went on to say, all this should make us wonder about the usual presentation of human, human evolution in introductory textbooks. She doesn't fit, but she's still in the textbooks. This is their own secular community. You see, notice when you are a human being and you walk upright, your spine comes in vertically to the base of your skull. Everybody see it? When you are an ape, you walk, your spine goes in horizontally into the base of your skull, kind of rounded over in a curve. And for walking upward or upright, you need to have fine balance, flat face, upright skull, straight back, fully extendable hip joints, angled femur bones, fully extendable knee joints, long legs, arched feet, and big strong toes. And you say, yes, I can read that too, but they can't on the radio, which is why I read it. You're different. You're gonna to need to remember how the spine enters the skull. Everybody? Good. David Ketchpool, PhD, New Evidence, Lucy was a knuckle walker, said this from Answers in Genesis. Anatomist Dr. Charles Oxnard 
has shown that the big toe actually sticks out as in chimpanzees, what they suspect was from Lucy. Again, not what they have drawn. This coming from life science, or the life, the science of biology, 1992. They draw Lucy with feet. This is from the St. Louis Zoo. They draw Lucy with human feet. Here again, drawing Lucy with human feet, yet no hands or feet were found. When called out about this, Dr. Uh, David Menton, Professor David Menton, we'll hear that name again, he said, this is a complete misrepresentation. And I believe they know it's a misrepresentation. <clears throat> the answer was zoo officials have no plans to knuckle under. We can't, nice pun. We cannot be updating every exhibit based on every new piece of evidence. We look at the overall exhibit and the impression it creates, we think the overall impression this exhibit creates is correct, even though they know they have feet that were not found. Professor Betsy Schulman, evolutionist expert, she admits the statue's feet probably are not accurate, but when asked whether or not it should be changed, she said, absolutely not. Huh. In other words, evolution must use bad science to deceive people. They don't have them. So this is what they have. Again, anybody see feet? This little triangular bone here actually belongs to a different animal. It was discovered later and realized it doesn't belong, but often the photos still include it. Again, they do not have the full structure of the, the skull here. They just have some fragments, and yet they know exactly, supposedly, what it looks like. And then we have this. They found something alive and well here in 1996 in Sumatra. It has banana-shaped feet. Each foot has four toes and an almost straight row with a fifth kind of sticking out again, as they do for apes, jutting out on one side, and it looks a whole lot like Lucy. Peking man. Peking man was made from pieces of skull found in, want to take a guess? Peking, China, in the 1920s. Sadly, all the evidence was lost. What people aren't told about this, though, is with those remains, 10 humans were also found with these so-called monkey bones, which makes it very suspicious as to whether or not it's truly a missing link. Another one, Java man, how many remember this? Known as Homo erectus, you probably heard that name. Meaning erect ape man, dated by evolutionists at 500,000 years old, was made from a few scraps of bone in 1891 in Java, Indonesia. Dutch anatomist uh, Dr. Dubois, 1858 to 1940, believed in evolution and had gone to look for missing links between men and apes. Dubois took an ape's skull cap, three human teeth, plus a thigh bone found a year later and 50 feet away from a human and informed the world he had found the missing link. <clears throat> he hid the fact that he also found two normal human skulls in the same area. His deceit was, re was revealed 30 years later, roughly around 1921, 1922. This coming from the book Bones of Contention. The research was done. It was incorrect. It still shows up in charts. Yet in 1921-22, it was exposed for what it is. You'll see it again later. Then came Artie. Before Lucy came Artie, this coming from U.S. News, I believe, uh, 2009. The story of humankind is reaching far back another million years with the discovery of Artie, a hominid who lives 4.4 million years ago in what is now Ethiopia. The 110-pound, four-foot female roamed forest a million years before the famous Lucy, long studied as the earliest skeleton of a human ancestor. This older skeleton reverses the common wisdom of human evolution, said anthropologist, 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 you read it, Owen Lovejoy, Zzz, Owen Lovejoy of Kent State University. Just trying to pour it out. This coming from ABC News. Sometimes an ape is a 4.4 million year old fossil that sheds light on the evolutionary origins of human beings and sometimes an ape is just an ape. In case of Artie, the ape-like fossil recently discovered in Ethiopia and already being celebrated as the oldest found relative of modern human beings, the final determination depends on who's doing the talking. Here again, David Menton, who had a problem with Lucy's feet. David Menton, acclaimed anatomist and also a creationist, said, Artie's skull and feet are exactly the kind of skull and feet you would expect an ape to have and have none of the features of modern humans. Evolutionists want to call Artie ape-like. This creature is ape-like because she's an ape. Just call it an ape, he said. Then came Ida. Ida, 2009, May, National Geographic. Meet Ida, the small missing link found in Germany. That's created a big media splash and will likely continue to make waves among those who study human origins. They analyzed the 47 million year old fossil seen above. Hang on to that. 
This is the first link to all humans whom of the natural, natural History Museum in Oslo, Norway, said in a statement, Ida represents the closest thing we can get to a direct ancestor. Ida, properly known as Darwinian Smasile, Ida's case, scientists were able to examine fossil evidence of fur and soft tissue. How old? 47 million years. Soft tissue? We're going to come back to that after the flood. And even picked through the remains of her last meal, fruits, 47 million years, seeds, and leaves. Clearly, she had a Ziploc bag. I mean, that's got to be it. <laughs> this was May 2009. Here is October 2009. Remember Ida, the fossil recently announced in May with its own book and TV documentary? Experts protested that Ida wasn't even a close relative, and now new analysis supports their reaction. In fact, Ida is as far removed from the monkey ape human ancestry as a primate could be, said Eric Seifert of Stony Brook University in New York. The new analysis says Darwinianist Ida does not belong in the same primate category, primate category as monkeys, apes, and humans. Instead, the analysis concluded it falls into the other major grouping, which includes lemurs. Kids, they found King Julian. Madagascar, no, never mind. Third service, they'll know what I mean. So National Geographic breaks the story. China Daily gives the, re the true retraction. How many of you get China Daily? Again, Martin Lubnow's book, Bones of Contention, very good. Talks about the so-called cavemen, talks about the evidence with them and the record behind their discoveries. And he also quoted Takahata, who said, there is not enough fossil, enough fossil records to answer when, where, and how Homo sapiens emerged. So the question comes up, well then just how much, this is 2017, how much do they have for evidence? Because from our perspective, what we're being told, it's a slam dunk. So I decided to let them tell you themselves. This is Lee Berger at Googleplex 2017. I just have to say that um, on behalf of, of pretty much the entirety of the scientific community, uh, we probably owe more to your organization as an open access and open window into new areas of science than, than almost any other on the internet. That includes you know, the normal things you think of like Google Earth and Google Scholar that, that we depend on now almost completely as scientists, but also just Googling, which is a lot of fun. This sort of story that I'm going to tell you has a lot of those components in it. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about a, a discovery in human origins. I'm a paleoanthropologist. I look for early human ancestors. I actually look for the rarest sought-after objects on the planet. That's I'm in a field of science that actually probably has uh, more scientists in it than it does objects that we study. There are literally just a, a, a few thousand of these incredibly precious objects. Most of them are just fragments, tiny little bits and pieces. About 80% of the record of human origins in Africa represents isolated teeth. The remaining, say, 18% of that represents little bits and pieces of postcranial bones of which we almost have had no complete elements from the neck down. Those skulls and stuff that you see on National Geographic and such, those are incredibly rare, number in just a few dozen. What did we just hear? He said, I am in a field of science that actually probably has more scientists in it than it does objects that we study. There are literally just a few thousand of these incredibly precious objects. Most of them are just fragments, tiny little bits and pieces. About 80% of the record of human origins in Africa represents isolated teeth. Nebraska man. Teeth. The remaining, say, 18% represents little bits crushed, pieces of postcranial bones of which we almost have had no complete elements from the neck down, which means they don't know how it connects to the skull, which is where you make your money on whether or not it walks upright or not. They have almost none, but they're happy to tell you of all these different hominids that are supposedly walking upright, but they have almost none. Those skulls and stuff you see on National Geographic and such, those are incredibly rare, numbering just a few dozen. This came out for the 200th anniversary of Darwin's birth. This is coming from Richard Klein. This is coming off the movie Genesis Impact, which is quite good. I'll talk about it again later. But the thick vertical bars show the actual fossil evidence. Hopefully you can see these diff different vertical bars, thick ones. That's the actual fossil evidence that we have. And again, not many of them. 
The eight question marks that are circled in red show the inferred, hoped for, we think, relationships between the different fossil icons on the chart. So this is how we think they relate to each other. The dashed lines and the solid, thin little lines there, running horizontally, show the theoretical evolutionary connections between the fossil icons. In other words, how they hope they evolve from each other. So if it's a thin line or it's a dashed line, it's all speculation, as well as the question marks. The solid line is what they found. These things that we see, these thin lines, these dashed lines, they are not based on actual fossil evidence. In fact, if you look at this carefully, what you see is we have these different types of apes and humans that are reproducing after their own kind that they're trying to connect. But this is what really got me. Here's good old Homo erectus, proven wrong in 1922. What's he still doing there? Mike Riddle said this, evolutionists want to believe in evolution so badly they will resort to deceiving their followers and anybody else they can control in the education system, including professors, teachers, and students by making up data that does not exist. And when data is found that contradicts it, they suppress it. We'll get to that later. So watch out for these things because what they claim and what they find are two different things. Again, shout out to Mike Riddle, Riddle from his fossil record documentation that he did, very good from Institute for Creation Research. Oh, the geneticists. Yeah, they're working too, see? And their research now tells us it turns out that all of humanity is related to a single couple. We don't have time for that now. We'll have to get that later. <clears throat> Evidence for a young world. Again, answers in Genesis, good stuff. Genesis apologetics, relatively new, good stuff. You'll be seeing some clips from them. They have a great film, Genesis Impact. Really, really well done. Encourage you to go get one. Check it out. Again, Institute for Creation Research. Thanks, Mike Riddle. They have a great series, 12 DVD, Unlocking the Mysteries of Genesis. I'm almost finished. Very well done. Uh, very easy to get a hold of as far as understanding and what they're showing and all that. Very, very well done. Of course, Dr. Dino's been out there forever. There's other stuff there. But we need to go to Romans 1. Romans chapter 1. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold, that word hold is to hold down, suppress, or stifle, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, whether it be DNA, atoms, molecules, or anything else that we now understand exist, that his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain or foolish in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Look what happens. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to bird, birds, and to four-footed beasts, and to creeping things. Funny, that's evolution in reverse. Creeping things go to four-footed beasts, which go to birds, which go to man. You are not an accident of nature. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. The biologists and the geneticists know it. They know it. The other guys are going to have to catch up. The evidence is getting increasingly more on our side. It abruptly appeared. They reproduce after their own kind. And they clearly have a designer who made them. The good news is he told us who he is. He gave us a book that is the best archaeological book you could get for history. It's an incredible book as far as prophecy because it tells us what happens in the nations before it happens and it's happened throughout human history from Alexander the Great to Jesus riding in on a donkey to the fall of the Babylonian Empire. All these things are told before they happen. And he tells us that you've been made by God for a relationship with him and that relationship with him starts when you receive Jesus as your savior. If you will ask him into your heart by faith, he will come in, he will change you, he will give you the Holy Spirit, and suddenly a book that's been hard to read will become your best friend because now God is, in, is working in you to change you. 
But we're out of time. So let's stand. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your word. Thank you, Lord. You told us all they would find are things after their kind. And to the uh, conundrum of the anthropological community, all they can find are things after their kind. No matter how hard they try to make it work, the evidence is there. It's after its kind. And so, Lord, I pray for anyone here, anyone listening, anyone grinding your teeth, because they don't want to believe there's a God. I pray you'd speak to them. You are not against them, Lord. You actually died to save them. You took our place. And I pray their hearts might open. Thank you, Lord, for hiding millions of dead things all around the world in a jumbled order to let us know you are God, there is no other. Thank you for making us the way you did with DNA and mitochondrial DNA so incredibly complex it's either there or it's not because you wanted to leave them without excuse. So thank you, Lord. Please go with us this day. Thank you for the chance to gather publicly in Jesus' name. Amen.